all for being here again. Um, my name is uh, Vincent Tan, I'm one of the other uh, organizers of this, uh, of this uh, summer seminar. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, James Evans, uh, who's a professor of sociology at the University of uh, uh, Chicago, also director of the uh, uh, Knowledge Lab there, and um, also studying uh, knowledge in the, in the, in the broad sense. Um, also external professor at the Santa Fe Institute, if I understood correctly. Um, and who's working more, so uh, Philippe just talked uh, about uh, meta science. James Evans is a little bit more um, uh, interested in, well, a type of quantitative science studies, uh, quantitative uh, or computational uh, science studies, uh, perhaps even. Uh, at least looking at uh, more empirical studies in science. Um, he is well known for particular uh, for many publications uh, related to uh, uh, more empirical studies of science itself, narrowing of scholarship, which you already alluded to. Uh, and, uh, um, some of the uh, broader overviews of the fields, so the science of science. So it's a bit uh, what terminology we should use to designate something is always a, a tricky, uh, tricky business. Um, and we'll talk now today about uh, more demographical aspects of science. So instead of looking at, uh, well, we started with defining progress in science, and studying meta science, what is meta science, now diving into particular who is doing science and how does that affect uh, the type of science being done, also uh, of leadership and team science. Um, and so I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Thanks, thanks. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm gonna set a soothing chime on the, uh, uh, on my phone, I, I realized that I, I, I cut into my own time and uh, your lunchtime with my own comments. Uh, anyway, so, um, okay. So, I, anyway, I'm really delighted to be here. I'm delighted for this uh, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary conversation. And and I, I, I'm actually really um, excited about the Let a, Flower, a Thousand Flowers Bloom with respect to the delimitations of whatever this activity is uh, we're engaged in. Uh, reflecting on the nature of science. I think that these framings are consequential, but I think that actually the, uh, the challenge uh, and disconnection between the framings provides space. So at least they provide space for me to think about these things in, in different ways. So yeah, I'll be talking about the social, biographical, and demographical locuses of innovation. But I did squeeze in uh, some slides at the very end as a coda to engage with some of the things that have already been brought up, which is is, uh, is much of the rest of my work. Um, so, uh, as was mentioned, I run a little center called Knowledge Lab, which is just is trying to interrogate the nature of knowledge, but using large scale uh, data machine learning, intelligent crowdsourcing to, to, to do it, basically to create a reflective knowledge about knowledge. It's not the only way in which one could create it. It's one way. Um, and, uh, and I think it's, it, it should be judged by its, uh, its fruits. Um, and I would say underlying this idea, this broader idea is uh, what I'll call a kind of a market driven or pragmatist notion of science that there are, you know, values uh, that are held by scientists and society that drive <laughs> forth sensations and representations and understandings and expectations and strategies and their market basically for these outputs, you know, and the, the market that most characterizes scientists and scientific activity is the market for explanations in this context. And so I'm going to use uh, explanatory artifacts, uh, scientific papers, uh, and also predictive artifacts, uh, patents to interrogate and discuss uh, some of these activities. So uh, I would say the larger question which I'm engaged in is how does innovation or science as a system think and how could uh, it think better and uh, to kind of explore the possibility of normativity, uh, what might better mean? And given those betters, given those values, um, how what might we reorganize, understand, or evaluate the scientific activity as it's engaged in? And I've uh, been kind of, you know, engaged in, in these uh, discussions with scientists. I would say probably about a third of my activity is uh, in uh, doing uh, non-social, uh, but, you know, material, pharmacological, and other research using some of these tools, basically building robots uh, that kind of help nudge uh, scientific exploration and replication processes in ways that, that search, uh, in, in most ways, uh, automatically search for different kinds of, of uh, materials and, uh, and different kinds of values. So um, the chapters here will be one, uh, I'll talk about how flat teams uh, drive scientific innovation and confer more equitable productivity. Um, 
I'll talk about uh, aging limits and the rate of scientific advance. So how it is that aging fields slow the churn of ideas, the literal progress, and by here progress, I literally mean change and only change. Uh, and then uh, because of the discussion that we've already had, I threw in a PS, you know, or kind of like, uh, you know, Marvel movies have at the end is the kind of post credit scene that kind of pops up. So it'll be like that. It'll be like a montage uh, about how uh, not only do these things activate diversity in the context of science, but they also uh, provide the possibility of extending that diversity, uh, both for discovery and for robustness more broadly. So, um, so I'll start with uh, this idea uh, about kind of team structure and size and its implications for scientific activity. So um, uh, we had uh, a paper in Nature uh, you know, a couple of years ago uh, that really talked about how large teams uh, and then recent work this last spring, uh, just a couple of months ago, on how uh, um, kind of flatter teams end up shaping the nature of, of, uh, of innovative activity and how small disconnected teams effectively amplify it. So um, the underlying idea here is we were measuring uh, disruption in science. It's, it's a simple measure that really structurally characterizes the likelihood um, that scientific activity eclipses the work on which it builds, right? which is to say that when people think about a particular scientific work, um, they forget uh, that it was building on anything, <laughs> right, uh, by not citing uh, any of those prior works. And if you take this measure seriously, it's interesting, if you correlate it across uh, the words that are used, like this is the top and bottom of these distributions, uh, we weren't selecting or measuring for any of these things, but they automatically pop out, right? So uh, the things that are the most disruptive are changing, introducing, and advancing versus endorsing, confirming, and demonstrating. Uh, they're using tools, devices, and techniques versus theory models and hypotheses. Uh, they're asking how, what, and why versus across, within, and along. Like those are those are the tails of the distribution. I did not cherry pick those words, and they weren't uh, in the context of measurement. And it turns out, if you look across this distribution of scientific artifacts it unsurprisingly kind of characterizes some of these aspects, but it's structural, it's not semantic, and so it, it uh, ends up being robust and replicable and across a number of different artifacts. And when you do that, uh, you know, it, it provides a new view of scientific activity. These are two papers. Uh, uh, one won the Nobel Prize, uh, one didn't. They both have the same number of citations, but they're radically different in terms of the degree to which people are looking back to the sources. This is a Bose-Einstein condensation, basically, which was verified and empirically replicated. It won the Nobel Prize, but everything in it focused on the 1925 Bose and Einstein papers, right, the, and those that followed it, versus uh, the Bach et al. Uh, complexity science hand pile paper, which kind of kicked off a new field, and there really were kind of no ancestors. Everyone was, uh, no one was citing the few things on which uh, it relied. Uh, anyway, when you look at that, when you take that view of scientific activity, as you look at team size, this is uh, built on uh, a data of, of, of about, uh, uh, about 150 million uh, scientific teams, uh, and it doesn't matter which time period or where you cut, you know, what the size of a team is, you see this exponential decline in this likelihood of disruption as a function of, as a function of team size. And again, it doesn't matter where you cut it in the distribution. Um, and we find it in kind of article uh, artifacts, uh, patent artifacts. Uh, we also find it in software. Again, this is the top. We've got the bottom 5% uh, percent of the distribution. Uh, again, it, it doesn't matter which field or which time period uh, you look at. It doesn't matter if you look at you know, controlling for the same class of subjects uh, within the same person over time. When they step from one project to another, um, you see almost 70% of the effect conserved across those, those uh, transitive movements. Um, and uh, again, it doesn't matter what your, your slice is. It's statistically significant between 29 and 30 investigators. Right, so it's, I mean, this is not just a small numbers phenomenon. Obviously, there's a big difference between one and two and two and three, but there's still a difference in not the very tail, not between 999 and 1,000. Um, but, um, and, you know, so we're kind of con controlling or we, when we control for really dense empirical representations of topics through these autoencoders, which I won't uh, describe in detail now, you see the same effects. So the same kind of, 
projects by the same person, you see the same effect as they move back and forth across uh, across scheme sizes. Uh, and um, and one of the uh, one of the things that's that, that alters the character here is basically, you know, if you were to think, okay, well, what's the difference between, um, you know, if a production company is trying to decide whether or not to produce a new movie, are they going to pick like an independent script like Slumdog Millionaire, or are they going to pick Transformers Nine? Um, and the answer is Transformers Nine. Right, because it's Transformers eight receipts minus Epsilon. Like, you know, it's like that. I mean, it's, it, and this is what large teams systematically do, which is to say they focus on um, the most prominent, popular, and recent findings uh, to, well, I, I don't know why they do it, but uh, uh, re, uh, an effective outcome of their doing is it hedges their bets with respect to risk. Right, uh, so small teams are much more likely to look for older things which are less popular in the past on which to build, which decreases again the likelihood that these things are optically uh, rendered. And it also, uh, of course, this has an impact on um, uh, on the degree to which those findings get appreciated in the future, right? In the, the more distant future. Um, so um, large uh, scientific activities, which are focused on recent uh, important things, get the vast majority of their citations and attention in the immediate present. It's like momentum investing, uh, where it's small science or small activity science ends up having its largest impact in the much more distant future, uh, and it's more likely to, to change the character and direction of science. Um, so one of these things led us to the, the question of, well, what about how it is that scientific teams are organized? Now, when we were looking at scientific teams at the scale that we were looking at it, which is to say, you know, all publishing and patenting teams over the 21st and 20th centuries, then <coughs> getting a robust measure of structure was, was uh, non-trivial. Um, and, um, but we thought, well, what if there was a relationship between um, small teams, uh, large teams, and structure. So if small teams were flatter and, and large teams uh, were more hierarchical. Could we think about, you know, getting some kind of or building some kind of a measure, a trace, an incomplete, very reducible trace that might capture some of those differences? You know, in this particular case, could we get some uh, exploration of a ratio of, of those who were thinking about the guiding science to those who were muscularly engaged in the activity uh, of science uh, and open science to the rescue. Uh, so uh, because there's been this movement towards transparency and fairness, increasingly publications require an accountability of who did what in the context of science. And so um, those accountabilities look uh, kind of like, uh, like this, right? So uh, in this observing polymerization of 2D dynamic covalent polymers, We've got, you know, GZ, ZFC, and SDF conceived the idea and designed the experiments. GZ, ZFC, LY, and NH carried out the institute of SDM experiments and analyzed the data, KS, and MMF. Anyway, I'll go on, uh, or I won't go on. Uh, it goes on. Uh, but uh, so we gathered these descriptions for about 90,000 publications in Science, Nature, PNAS, and the PLOS family of journals where they've been uh, present uh, and required for a number of years. Uh, and then, um, and we looked at them. So for example, we just cluster by person those activities. Uh, and it's a, a natural uh, two or three cluster solution. It doesn't really matter uh, which clustering solution you pick because the distinction is always the same between uh, lead, supervise, design, conceive, and coordinate uh, what I'll call lead activities, because lead is literally the most frequent word and at the center of this distributional uh, network of activities by person, and support activities, which cluster themselves into direct and indirect support. And again, lest you think I'm engaging in extreme uh, interpretation, you know, generate, conduct, analyze, purify, prepare, assist. I mean, these are muscular activities or physical activities engaged in the activity of science. And the indirect support are, you know, participate, contribute, discuss, and comment. Uh, you know, so uh, uh, second order uh, assistance activities. Uh, and if you look, um, so 
uh, what we did was we, we took these uh, and we looked at their relationship to other empirical activities across the universe of scientific papers over the 20th and 21st centuries, which is to say, to what degree in a focal paper does an author's uh, an author contributes references, which is to say their history of scientific activity in the things that they referenced before is represented in the things that are referenced in this paper. To what degree do they contribute topics to an empirical, I mean, empirically contribute topics from their history of prior topics? To what degree are they seen as leading or corresponding authors? Literally, are they just, are they a first author? Are they a corresponding author in the paper? Um, also, career age, relative citations, topic diversity and number of publications, it turns out, you know, all of these things end up uh, providing a discriminatory boundary between whether or not you're engaged in leading or supporting activities, uh, which captures about 85% um, of the variation in uh, the cases in which we have presently. And so we extrapolated those back to the 17 million roughly publications that occurred between 1950 and, and 2015. Uh, and we see that, you know, if you look at the distribution of team roles across science, uh, that the distribution of leading as team size increases drops uh, exponentially, right? Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, so it's max is at two. Um, direct support is at a max of 11, right? Uh, and indirect support, so commenting, you know, I mean, that's maxing out at 25, right? So, so, uh, so definitely different sizes of teams change the composition, but there's vast variation, right? Even within any given team size, right? Uh, as to whether or not there will be hierarchy or flatness in the relative contribution to directing or leading activities. Um, and so that's what we're going to exploit in trying to understand the degree to which kind of flat or hierarchical teams end up shaping uh, the outcomes of science. And so, um, so we look both at, in this particular case, that, that measure of disruption, which is this likelihood of eclipsing prior work. We also look at something called uh, novelty uh you know combinatorial novelty it's measured in a number of different ways we take some complicated measures and, and turn them into kind of a vectorized approach which is robust and can scale the content so to what degree are basically people combining things which have infrequently been combined in the past uh, and it seems for both of these activities when we look at the relative lead ratio so this is the ratio of uh you know, those who are described as leading uh, activities in the paper to those who are described uh, anywhere as contributing to the paper, anywhere in the masthead. Um, we see both this decrease in developmentality, right? So this decrease in the likelihood that it will disrupt by, you know, almost 200%. Uh, and this significant but smaller increase in novelty across. Uh, and it turns out that these effects are larger uh, than the effects of team size. So, uh, so the effect of composition themselves actually, uh, um, uh, you know, themselves eclipse and outweigh the kind of the team size uh, impacts uh, in shaping these. Now it turns out um, that it doesn't just shape the way in which science is received and the activities of science, right, as an event with respect to its historical past, but they also shape the distribution of credit. And I think this gives us a little bit more of an indication about why it is that these practices continue from the perspective of individual scientists building teams. Um, so what we see is basically um, the lead author productivity as the lead ratio goes up decreases, right? So, so the scientists who are leading teams that are flatter get less credit, right? Um, but the scientists who actually are engaged in support activities substantially get more credit. This was completely not obvious to us, and it was actually the opposite of what I expected. Um, they actually get substantially less credit across their CDs as a function. Again, this is all controlling for um, the distribution of activities. It's within person, within scientific area, etc. So, th so this is not accountable or accounted for by like different distributions of scientific activity in different areas of science. It's all within each area of science. Um, 
And, and I think this is likely one of the things that's providing continuance here. Um, it also matters for the future of scientific consumption, which is to say uh, that these flatter teams are much more likely um, to have longer term impact, which is to say to have their highest citation growth and appreciation in decades further into the future uh, than, um, than basically low teams uh, where they're much more likely, 121% more likely to have uh, attention kind of in the moment or within uh, a very few years of the citation appreciation impact. Um, and it turns out, uh, you know, again, some of these things are descriptive, but, but the L ratio, this lead ratio predicts um, who would receive the Nobel Prize from a collection of papers across uh, those, uh, those prize winning papers um, with about 80% accuracy, uh, which is very distinct from predictions of collective credit allocation, right? So these collective credit allocation cases are what people have typically used to say, okay, well, what are people in the far future citing with the paper that eventually would be credited with winning the Nobel Prize? Further, these are available, of course, on the moment of publication or even the moment before publication, essentially at pre-publication. Uh, moreover, Nobel laureates are 42% more likely to begin their careers working on flat teams. This is a chicken and the egg question here, but it does suggest the potential uh, and the hypothesis that basically flat teams facilitate and not only reflect um, the development of, of the kinds of critical investigation intelligence that might be behind path breaking uh, and, uh, and field changing discoveries. Um, and, uh, and so, one of the reasons why this is interesting or might be interesting to, to someone uh, is that these things are changing. These aren't constant uh, and teams are becoming much more hierarchical over historical time uh, and that progression is accelerated over time. Um, so uh, there's increasing numbers of teams that are not only larger but, but uh, more likely to be, be led by fewer uh, investigations and investigators. And, and uh, again, I pose this not as a policy prescription, but just something worth uh, consideration, which is to say that there is a strong personal incentive for the scientists who develop these teams to benefit from those teams independent from uh, the, uh, the collective uh, benefit of those teams for, for science as a project. So I think, you know, in this idea of individual versus collective, which seems to be the one of the foundations of this discourse, I'm suggesting that there are across these kinds of investigations specific uh, uh, segmentations and um, and uh, not only non-overlaps but uh, and deviations but conflicts between individual incentive and large-scale incentive that are worth uh, considering. Um, okay, now I'm going to shift to a related uh, biographical and demographical locus of innovation uh, question. Um, and so uh, I'm really going to just ask this question of what happens to scientists age, because that's another thing that's dramatically changing over the course of the 20th and 21st century science. Uh, scientists are older than they've ever been before. Uh, and, uh, and so um, people in the past have, have asked questions about this idea of the burden of knowledge. This is Ben Jones, an economist at uh, Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Business, who asked this question about the death of the Renaissance man is innovation getting harder. And he observed uh, this fact that uh, the age at first innovation, whether that was the receipt of a grant to the publication of a major paper, turns out not to be true for the publication of the first patent, um, is growing over time and systematically over the course of the 20th century. Whether you look at awards or papers or grants, um, uh, the effect is the same. He posits. Uh, you know, is it that science itself is necessarily becoming more mature, that there are just fewer low hanging fruits, and so we need to climb higher along the trees of knowledge? Uh, of course, that explanation also doesn't account for the fact that, you know, there may be other trees uh, that haven't been explored. And, and um, this is also focused on the extreme, uh, which is to say, you know, with Nobel Prizes, like what's the age of Nobel Prize, but what's what's the average activity across the scientific distribution um, uh, is a question that I pose. Another paper that was uh, really, I think, important that built off of this 
Max Planck uh, idea. New scientific truth is usually not propagated in such a way that opponents become convinced and discard their previous views. No, the adversaries eventually die off and the upcoming generation is familiarized anew uh, with the truth. Of course, this was canonized by Kuhn and others and reflecting on, on uh, replication cycles uh, and, and, uh, and revolutionary cycles in the context of science. Uh, an empirical paper by, uh, by economists Pierre Azoulay, Christian Fons Rosen, and, and Josh Graf Zivin um, looked at this and found that systematically when scientists uh, die, this is star scientists, and if you can define their fields as they do in a very uh, separable way, these are small scientists, <coughs> but when, a, when a, a star in one of those subfields dies and they have a database at the time, now it's larger, but of 485 scientists who prematurely died, sometimes from very rapid things, you know, like a car accident that was completely unanticipated, sometimes from like slower moving things like prostate cancer and everything in between. And they measure uh, the relative surprisingness at death um, that, uh, that their deaths were systematically associated with a burst of activity, creative and impactful activity within those subfields. So we were just asking the question, okay, what happens on average for the average scientist? Not for star scientists, not over historical scientific advances. What, and, and how can then we think about collective age with respect to advance within fields? So um, just a cartoon, uh, uh, but a historical example. As a 26-year-old examiner at the Patent Office in Bern, Switzerland, Einstein wrote four papers that really revolutionized science's understanding of space, time, mass, and energy in 1905. In the decade following, he generalizes uh, this notion of special relativity to general relativity. Um, from mid-career, he thought uh, he sought unsuccessfully, I mean, this is not all, well, it's, it's a lot of what he did, uh, so unsuccessfully to assemble core physics into a unified field theory and spent his later years criticizing quantum mechanics, probabilistic interpretation of the universe, posing quantum paradoxes until the end, some of which ironically were demonstrated and enshrined uh, and really institutionalized the, the quantum age. So the question is, was the young Einstein unique in promoting new areas with minimal reference to competitors? And was the old Einstein unique in defending past work against emerging ideas inconsistent or irrelevant to it? And the answer is no. And the reason that matters is because the distribution demographically of science and sciences are also dramatically changing over time, which changes this collective question asking, asking and answering over time. So um, the kind of the possibilities you can imagine science moving in time and here uh, you, you could impose a, a logic of progress. I'll just suggest a logic of change, uh, which could be progressive or regressive or whatever. I mean, it, this is not, uh, uh, and that scientists basically age slower than their best ideas, right? So these ideas in science actually decrease in relative uh, attention uh, and informativity over time. And that scientists basically have typically, not typically, uh, but uh, in the best of scenarios, a couple of acts. You know, they jump from something that has become less popular to something that is uh, decreasing more slowly or came uh, more lately. And so this is what we see uh, as we actually look at physical scientists. These are physicists, actual physicists jumping basically from case to case as uh, their relative ideas fall from the frontier uh, of scientific attention. And it turns out that this is the case uh, for um, the you know, 200 million scientists that we looked at uh, over the course of the 20th and 21st century. That the, the, your favorite publication uh, for all scientists in all time periods, uh, on average for all fields, is one year before your first publication. So uh, that was, you know, that was the imprinting activity that was, you know, that was the, the new science uh, that was coined. So this is the peak of that distribution is at negative one. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, if you keep publishing for a long time, you, you can, you know, I mean, this, 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 there's a tail to that distribution. You, you can learn new things. You do learn new things. Uh, but uh, if you're successful early on, it dramatically increases the rate of aging. Uh, and I think this is not just from individual proclivity, but uh, I was chatting uh, earlier at the break uh, with someone that, uh, you know, Thomas Kuhn, you know, the success of his book meant that he could never escape his book. 
right? It was the most cited uh, book of the 20th century, by far, nonfiction book of the 20th century. Uh, and he literally could not move on, not necessarily by intention, but by, you know, community and design. Uh, and again, it doesn't matter. Uh, the only the only field that varies basically from this slope, which is about aging a month a year, a month of citation age uh, every year, is the one field whose methods have effectively not changed in the last 200 years, right? Mathematics, right? So basically, you know, if you were born in 1890, uh, a paper, you know, uh, is just as true, you know, today as it was at the moment in which you got your degree, right? And so uh, they're much more, they, they age at two months a year, basically. Um, turns out the same is true if you look at the churn of keywords, so the annual keyword repetition, so you stop, I mean, you increase the likelihood that you're kind of repeating, uh, you drop uh, from convergence of that frontier, uh, and then this is where collectives come in. So if you look at the churn rate versus the proportion in a field that's old, there's the strong negative, as proportion goes up, the churn of new ideas within a field dramatically uh, decreases. Um, moreover, and I'll, I'll dissect that in just a minute, criticism accelerates. So we basically identified building on the work of the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence and a number of others who basically tried to classify the context of cited works in papers, uh, one of the distinctions between those, uh, uh, the, the different ways in which science might be used is, um, is between, you know, critical, right? So I'm, I, you know, uh, you know, as opposed to, you know, X, I'm going to, you know, so critical citations versus supportive citations that I'm building on those citations. So when we basically go through and classify these across the sciences, um, then we see on average, so here's the Higgs boson paper. Um, these are the papers uh, of investigators on average that were older than Higgs. Uh, these are the papers uh, that were younger than Higgs. Uh, and it turns out that this characterizes the distribution of all these activities, which is to say, as you grow older than the papers that you're citing, it dramatically increases the likelihood that you'll criticize those papers. And in fact, the criticism rate itself goes up and really um, uh, peaks uh, at about 10 years, which is to say, you know, 10 year plus. So basically on average scientists get to a place at 10 plus years where they're systematically uh, and disproportionately policing the boundaries of their fields. Um, and, uh, and so when we look at this with respect to the collective, um, what we find uh, again is that these uh, that there's both a collective and an individual influence of age, which is to say um, that. And again, this is you know this is not an experiment. I'm not proposing the the uh, youth and you know zation of scientists. No scientists were harmed in the production of these results. Um, this is completely observational. But uh, uh, but it, it, it correlationally. There, you know, there's a science, there's a scientific age effect, and there's an additive um, effect from the collective age of the field, right? In um, the relative age of your citations, uh, and um, it's actually a little bit different with respect to your criticism rate because fields, as they systematically age, they're systematically less to criticize. Like there's less, fewer, newer works with new ideas and concepts which are Product, which are produced in this context, when we do uh, an analysis that tries to get whether or not, you can imagine there's a circular correlation there, right? So, so sciences uh, that basically are just running out of ideas, right, could stop attracting new young scientists or that feel like they're not attracting new young scientists or have a, a higher old proportion decrease the likely, you know, distribution or churn of ideas. And it turns out that uh, the distribution of ages far proceeds in prediction. It's much more likely with a kind of a Granger causal analysis. It's much more likely to predict um, the decreasing churn than the decreasing churn is to predict the aging uh, of the field. Right. So it's 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 almost uh, and again this you know it's 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 correlational, but it's 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 not just correlational. It's dynamically correlational uh, in this particular context. So. Um, now it's not that science uh, and scientists can never grow young again. Uh, 
they, uh, you know, they can, you know, if they're vampires, they can feed off of the blood of their young collaborators. Uh, and uh, insofar as you collaborate with more younger people, it does decrease the relative age of your citations. If you jump to new institutions, it decreases your age. If you jump to new topics, then you reboot effectively. Uh, surprise, surprise. Um, so I, I would say the, the kind of the conclusion before the postscript, before the post credit scene is that um, activating the diversity of the scientific uh, uh, teams and fields facilitates the catalyzation of advanced progress or change, okay? Um, which is to say that innovation in science and culture is fundamentally a high dimensional uh, phenomena requiring novel combinations of people, techniques, and problems. Population and team structure um, end up activating uh, this diversity uh, in, in, in this diverse intelligence in this context. Uh, hierarchical teams are constrained by essentially the number and the breadth of, of what I'll call brains at the top. And aging scientists are effectively constrained uh, by brains in the past, right? Or their, their former brains or former thoughts. So uh, now, um, again, I, 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 maybe no one here has ever seen a Marvel uh, movie, but, uh, but if, you, if you have, or if you haven't, but, but might, uh, you want to stick around. You want to stick around because after the credits, there's, there's another one or two juicy bits. So um, I'm going to throw in just a couple of juicy bits that try to respond to the broader discussion here that relate these demographic trends to thoughts about uh, scientific reason and progress in my remaining five minutes. It'll be largely a montage. So, um, so one of the ways in which uh, we've looked at science uh, in the past is kind of in terms of its characteristic reason or explanations, the nature of empirical explanations that are deployed. Um, there are philosophically uh, a number of cartoons about what those uh, rationales and reasons might look like. One would be Aristotelian syllogisms and deduction. Uh, the other would be, you know, a Baconian uh, induction that imaginably generalizes from prior observations, or um, a kind of a Persian, so Charles Sanders Peirce, the American philosopher of the 19th century, who posited this idea of abduction, uh, right, which is effectively uh, the car collision between deduction and induction. You posit or expect a result. Um, the findings violate that, or an accident violates that, which motivates the generation of uh, uh, and mobilization of new hypotheses to make the surprising unsurprising. Um, and, um, and so in the context of trying to do this and understand the nature of science, we built a highly predictive model of all future papers. Again, our representation of the papers is extremely uh, you know, impoverished. It's like they're a set of, of objects, you know, like, you know, concepts, which could be properties or materials or whatever. But we, we take that set of keywords uh, and all those overlapping sets, uh, which we'll call a hypergraph, and we build like a big manifold that predicts that we fit that manifold so the things that are close together are the most likely to be drawn together in the context of any particular paper. Then we roll that manifold with Brownian motion uh, across time periods and draw down the most likely next hypergraph. And that's our prediction of, of future papers that predicts almost everything. I mean, uh, again, it's not, uh, again, it's, I mean, these are just sets of sets. It's not like these are particular claims. But it predicts almost everything, just saying that science is inertial and, and, and it's slow moving. But, um, and we do this across a bunch of areas. Uh, if you take the inverse of this, which is to say, of course, there are things that are surprising. It's just there's not that many of them. Uh, but if you take basically the deviation from this best prediction, this shrink-wrapped prediction, uh, and look at surprise, it turns out that those surprises disproportionately capture the attention of the scientific landscape. So um, surprises in pulling together keywords and surprises in pulling together contexts or the journals and conferences uh, from which those keywords are drawn additively um, you can predict almost 60% of the likelihood of being in the top 10% of citations. And it's even higher if you look at like the top 1% of citations, even before, if you, if you, you have no knowledge of the people who produced it, the institutions they would come from, where the thing would eventually be published, et cetera. So um, better than any other ex ante predictor uh, in this context. Uh, and then we ask ourselves the question of who's doing that reasoning? So what accounts for those surprising things? 
Um, it's interesting. It's, 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 you know, it's, the lower side of that novelty distribution is characterized partly by surprising careers. Uh, so people who've done multiple different kinds of things. Uh, some of it's accounted for by surprising teams, which is to say unusual combinations of people. But the most, and this is both in the physical and the biological and the social sciences, are expeditions of people who come from one part of the scientific space and traverse to an audience in another part of the scientific space. Um, again, suggesting that both within teams, across fields, and again, across, across fields, uh, this kind of cognitive and experiential diversity ends up being associated with advance, change, uh, progress, uh, et cetera. Um, and, um, and it turns out that this is true not only for exploration, but it's also true for replication. Um, and here, you know, I, I really mean conceptual replication, which is to say another approach at taking the same experiment and validating it in some other context. So how did we look at this? Well, we just align published claims, like hundreds of thousands of published, very specific publicated, published claims about, you know, something like gene-gene replication or the relation between a perturbagen, like a drug uh, or a vaccine against you know, uh, a disease-related gene, uh, or we, I mean, we did a number of contexts, those are two. And then we line them up with massive high throughput experiments that basically massively replicate. When I say massive, it's not that massive. It's like 200 replications per claim across cell lines, across dosage levels, across whatever. Um, and what we find is systematically that findings from decentralized communities are much more likely to replicate. Right, so you have greater centralization and think of this in terms of like the brains and muscles, the lead ratio was describing earlier. So it's not just that those leads are more likely, those kind of you know, higher leads are more likely to, uh, or I'm uh, sorry, high lead ratios are more likely to explore more. It's that when you look at that lead ratio, the diversity across the scientific space, if you have flatter and more disconnected scientific teams, oh, my soothing chime. Um, so uh, when you have the, these flatter communities, right, it's much, much more likely for the claims to replicate um, outside of the context of those communities. Uh, and the reason I think, and you can use this to basically predict robust findings over time. And, and uh, it turns out that uh, one of the reasons why I think this is interesting in the context of this, what I was kind of suggesting, I, mean, I, I believe in the importance of reproducibility, but for example, the very same day, one of the papers that I published on this uh, came out, um, there was a cell systems paper that came out the same day that was saying, hey, let's increase replication of this massive Lynx L1000 experiment. <laughs> And so what we're going to do is we're going to take all the centers that are building this and we're going to basically like make sure everyone's using exactly the same protocol. Everyone's using exactly the same line, the same cell lines, and that's going to increase the replicability for this massive biomedical resource across these places. And it's like, I'm like, no, you know, like in the spirit of reproduction of biomedical science, you're decreasing the value of biomedical science for biomedicine. Right. Uh, so I think that's that that was just the context I was suggesting earlier that that sometimes if it's not thought about in the context of the broader space of scientific values, in this case, the robustness of a finding across the context of experimentation, then there could be uh, problems. And I will just say a final, uh, you know, kind of like uh, it's not really a science fictional point, but, you know, can we design the diversity that increases or broadens collective imagination? even beyond the context of our existing teams. Well, um, it turns out that when you try to do that, it produces kind of interesting results. Um, so we took a, a classic kind of AI hypothesis generation engine. This was a nature paper in 2019. We basically modeled the, uh, the collective inferences and we can talk about how later, but, uh, but if you take into account the people, the distribution of people who might be available to make uh, or who, uh, for whom the cognitive availability of the claims is accessible, so they could make uh, future scientific uh, claims, you increase the prediction by more than 100%, by one to 500%. So by just taking into account the distribution of scientists over the space of claims, you can dramatically increase the probability of the things that will be discovered and published. That's not very interesting technologically because that's like a scoop machine. You know, it's like, how can we, how can we destroy all scientific, you know, 
uh, uh, the, the, the credit for all scientific activity, but you can, and you, we know that it works because you can predict the particular scientists who are gonna make the particular claims. Um, but you can also dial this the other direction. Can we make basically the most scientifically likely, but the least scientifically likely, like the least likely to be available to scientists claims in these scientific spaces. And it turns out if you do that, of course, those things are less likely to be published. And if they're published, they're more likely to be published years in the future, but they're also more likely on average to be true when we run these through experiment. And that's because likely of the diminishing marginal returns to theory. Again, underlying uh, the importance of a broader demographic uh, social and cognitive basis, basically for the diversity of scientific uh, intelligence that can be instrumented here. Anyway, with that, I'll, I'll close. Um, you know, lots of friends helped. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, I, I love your questions. Thanks. For a very uh, interesting uh, and uh, well, very uh, broad, wide-ranging uh, uh, presentation. Um, if there are perhaps first um, any questions for clarification of any of I'll take it. Many, many different uh, concepts that are explained. Okay. Uh, yes. I want to ask to clarify the slide you mentioned: cell systems paper, a multi-center study, etc. No. But I didn't really get your point about um, the robustness. How you felt? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So okay, so so the Lynx L1000 study um, is a, a large-scale multi-institutional uh, experiment that basically takes you know a thousand central genes in these kind of hierarchy uh, uh, um, in these genetic regulatory hierarchies, and then they extrapolate the function of those genes to the rest of the genome. Uh, so they're basically testing against those presumably disease-related or hierarchically relevant genes, what's the influence of different perturbogens? And then they can use that perturbogen design to also look at gene-gene interactions, right? Because if, you know, if like you perturb a gene with a, a drug and then, you know, uh, its absence perturbs another gene, then you can indirectly look at that. So, so the reason they're doing that is so that they can develop genetic medicine and improve the development of therapies that will be useful in clinics. So my concern with the study is they basically narrowed the space of studies. So they basically attempt to maximize the reproducibility within the experimental resource. They reduce the, the, the dimension of that experimental resource. There are a number of ways, for example, a number of protocols by which you could perform any one of those experiments by restricting them to one right? It was a multi-institutional replication, but by effectively making this seemingly multi-institutional replication a single institutional replication, right? this, this, this one or maybe 1 1.1 or 1 1.2 independent experiments now being performed, um, this whole resource actually decreases the likelihood of its relevance to a context which is outside itself. That's what I demonstrated previously. Uh, and the outside itself is the only place that anyone who funded the study matters, which is, which is the clinic. Like, how can it actually improve people's genetic health? So, and we can talk more about it in detail afterwards, but, you know, yeah. Also a clarification question. Very nice talk, nice findings. And, uh, but this eclipsing measure, uh, does this incorporate the practice of citing, for example, a review paper? That uh, so sometimes that happens. There's stuff that happens before. There's a review, and everybody just starts to cite that one review because it's easier. Uh, does that? Yeah. So that yeah. So it, 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 I mean, I mean, it, 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 in and of itself, it doesn't. But of course, we get rid of review papers. We add okay. review papers in. We also look at the effect just for review papers, right? So we look at just empirical or just for like just for review papers. Um, you know, if you have like one more author on your review paper, you're the same person, the topic is indistinguishable from a kind of intense embedding of the topic space, you still see, again, about 66% of the effect, even just within review papers, but also restricting the papers upon which they say. So it's a, it's a great question. Uh, it doesn't happen to, to, to change the, the thing. We, we could, we tried to break, break it, we couldn't, we couldn't break it. Um, Let's start with yeah, so you talked about in the beginning about disruptive papers and developmental papers. And 
can you briefly say again what you mean by it? And I was also wondering, do you think one of them is better for science than the other? Or ah. what's the other <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like, why do we even design the research this way? It's an excellent, leading, but totally excellent and legitimate question. So I think um, I, what we were suggesting, okay, this came out of the context of my, so I, before COVID, uh, it's like the, the before COVID and after COVID era of my life. But the before COVID era, I used to go to China about eight times a year to work and help them develop a variety of different centers. And, and when I was there chatting with the National Science Foundation of China lead, and they, they, they have a, a flow problem. They get 200,000 proposals a year, for example, reviewing those is a challenge. They have, they have all, you know, and so when you have all kinds of complexity, what do you do? You try to reduce that uncertainty by looking at what your partners are doing. So they were looking at, okay, look, the U.S. has, you know, like bigger teams, more hierarchical teams, you know, like maybe that would reduce the complexity of our grant funding effort, you know, so they're basically trying to engage in isomorphic institutional mimicry to solve their problem. And uh, it just made me be like, whoa, you know, what if, you know, the structure of scientists, the science that we inherit has something to do with institutional and incentive forces that are independent of their scientific merit and benefit. So really what I was trying to do there is to suggest not that like all teamwork should be, you know, like flat, you know, kumbaya singing collectives, you know, that are like, but just that there's a multi-equilibrium uh, solution in science, which is to say that science dramatically benefits or is empirically seen to benefit by having a robust distribution of small and large teams, and that distribution of small teams is shrinking, right? And it's shrinking in its funding, and it's shrinking in its impact, and it's making science more like blockbuster films, which is to say, if you don't hit the block, the you know box office your first weekend, then you will be forgotten forever, and that's a that's potentially a problem. So that was, uh, but yeah. So I don't think one is better than the other, uh, but they do different things. Like one highlights yesterday's science. Another generates new directions empirically. I mean, that's not a, that's not a value based question. That's what that that is what they do, and um, and that you, you both activities are, are potentially important for for scientific change, certainly and by extension scientific advance. Thank you. Um, I was wondering in particular because the first part of your talk sort of drove us towards a greater people appreciation of the sort of smaller teams. And then the second part of your talk was also a little bit sort of appreciation of diversification and you mentioned about how these sort of across across uh, jumpers or fields might actually sort of explain part of disruption and what i was wondering about it tend to be small teams tend to be small teams but what i was wondering about there is doesn't it sort of typically happen if people sort of maybe like jump fields or in, even sort of policy wise if we more start to value a diverse way of doing science we see an increase of teams typically right people sort of people jump a field and they might sort of jump into an already existing team or whatnot so is there a way in which those two can be in tension how can we accommodate that uh okay so i think so when you jump so it's interesting i was wondering you know why is it not like diverse teams of the things that make this thing and i think i think it's because a diverse team requires a social contract like these different people from different perspectives have to buy into the fact that their collaborative expertise itself will be valuable and so i think this is why we're systematically seeing uh, the biggest Novelty is not coming from diverse teams, but coming from these expeditions, which are, which are again, you know, they're interlopers. These are carpet baggers. These are people from other parts of, and and once they ge generate something which is perceived by the field to be valuable, first it's surprising and then valuable, um, then that's like, you know, that's like the document that's required for the social contract, you know, to like, oh, here we're going to apply to the you know, to the ERC to get funding, because look, there was this amazing paper that showed the value of this approach being used in this case. So it's, so when, when you see people from outside incorporated into existing teams within the field, those are systematically associated with non-disruptive papers and projects. So I, I think that, um, but to your broader historical point, it is true that if you look at the distribution of things that are cited, either in terms of just like a, 
a citational kind of information theoretic diversity or like a semantic diversity. You just look at like the titles that we cite over the last hundred years. It's true that the thing that characterizes modern science, by modern science, I will date it to like 1962, because if you look at these curves, they scream 1960s, is that's where people systematically start citing stuff that's more different from themselves. Um, and then it actually kind of like slows down a little bit, but then it like stabilizes from the 1980s. These are dramatically different from, from the sciences, all the sciences or any of the sciences, doesn't matter how you cut it from before the 1960s where they were much more narrow. So I think it is true that we're kind of moving in this direction. And what I would say is that maybe we could consider this as a value. We could consider this, this happenstance as a value uh, because it's ended up being correlated with a number of aspects of advance. If we did, then how would we continue that value by reflecting on and maybe constraining some of the trends that we're seeing now? So. Um, well, I'll move to actually uh, an online question. Uh, so our earlier speaker from uh, today, uh, Tom Robottom Hatchie, uh, First question in the chat. Um, I'm hoping you are at your screen, uh, Daryl, um, and are able to unmute yourself and yes, and press uh, turn. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm at my screen. I'll just I'll just read the question out. Uh, it has two parts. It pertains to the findings concerning small teams, which I find very interesting. First, I, I find it plausible, as, as was suggested, that small teams try to be bolder to increase their chances of having significant impact. But I wondered if you had any specific evidence to support this, or if you knew of any. So are there any interviews or surveys of the groups of scientists, for instance? Second, I'm reminded of Kuhn's claim that breakthroughs are often made by people relatively new to an area, um, who are not fully indoctrinated into the paradigm or disciplinary matrix, as he would have said. Seems he was right. So I wonder, I think maybe you just hinted an answer to this. I wonder if small teams are more likely to be formed by newer members of a community. Um, and I also wonder in some cases if the if behavior of different kinds of scientific activity is going to affect group size. So like um, if you're a simulator or if you're doing wet work, I think you might be more likely to be in a larger group rather than a theoretician, a uh, pen and paper theoretician. And I wonder if that might also skew effects. Thanks. Uh, great questions. Uh, so I'll start with the last one and then work to the first one. So the last one is, does it matter which areas of science and in particular, if you're a theoretician or an empiricist? Uh, and the answer is uh, yes, it differs, which is to say, obviously empirical uh, scientists are involved in larger teams and need more muscles, you know, uh, which is to say, you know, people performing the science, whether or not they engage in uh, the, the design of the science. Um, but the, all these findings hold independent of that, which is to say in theorist teams doing theorist work and researchers doing review papers uh, among just empirical pieces, controlling for every area of science and every time period that we look at, we, we, we find, again, it's not like there's no variation, but we, we find within a bound, you know, like 70, within 70 to 100% of the finding, well, 70 to 130% of the finding that we actually find. So, uh, so yes, of course, those things vary. The impact and the slope of the impact doesn't vary across those things. Um, I think uh, the question about uh, whether, you know, what, does this somehow provide some justification that, that Kuhn was right about, you know, people who are less, uh, I think, yes, I think it, it definitely provides some, some real support for his, notion of, of the flexibility or an early life or from outsiders um, with respect to the way in which they view these things. I'm not just my work, but I think the work I'm, that I'm building on. Um, I think, uh, is it likely that, uh, is it more likely that um, these teams that are traversing, uh, that small teams are also uh, people more likely to be outside uh, the field? And the answer is yes but it doesn't matter. I mean, yes, uh, the teams from the outside are more likely to be uh, small teams. And I think this is partly, again, who's willing to bet on them until they succeed. Uh, so I think this is partly a financial uh, reason, you know, state backed like rationality behind these things. Um, uh, but it turns out when I say it doesn't matter, I just mean to say that even if we account for that, if we control for these uh, differences of insider or outsider-ness um, that uh, we still see 
if we just look at insiders, if we just look at outsiders, if we look at insiders coming in, anyway, any way you cut the data, we still find the small team and the flat team effect. So, so those are forces, you know, at, at, at work. And then, um, dang, what was the first question? I the first one was about whether um, teams, small teams try to be bolder, whether there's kind of any other supplementary, um, you know, social scientific evidence um, for that. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, we surveyed people, we interviewed people, uh, but I actually feel like, I mean, I, I mean, the reason we measured it in this way, which is to say, you know, we're looking at the things that scientists themselves are citing and the way in which they're citing them. I, I, I mean, the, we, the reason we did that is because we felt like it was one way of surveying, you know, millions of living and dead scientists, but it did correspond with, with anecdotal surveys and discussions with scientists, living Sorry, scientists. I, mean, I expect you to write, I, I was just curious. I mean, it seems like a highly plausible, um, you know, explanation. Thanks a lot. It's a really interesting talk. Thanks. Thank you. Um, first two. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful uh, presentation. I'm, uh, I think it's very important to look at so many data, so many papers, so many citations. I'm also still recovering for, for, from the plethora of, uh, of data and graphs that you gave us. I'm, uh, so, I'm sorry for the PS, I just couldn't resist. Yeah, yeah, I just I, squeezed I them in. I know. <laughs> it was your fault. Yeah. Your questions, you know. The, the, you know. <laughs> so my question is, of course, uh, we know if you use like an outcome, if I understood it correctly, you use as outcome citations, the number of citations, but also Nobel Prize. Um, and I was wondering, this inherently comes with a lot of limitations. I'm wondering how did you deal with these limitations? Because it's not Nobel Prize. Well, there are plenty of Nobel Prizes that are that shouldn't be given, for example. And of course, it's a great way to uh, to uh, give someone a prize uh, for an important uh, finding. But there yeah, are it's, it's, yeah, it's a great question. I, I love. I, I so one of the things I didn't show, shouldn't have shown given my time, I shouldn't have even shown the paper that led to this question, but I did. And uh, one of the things that we found, we looked at, at, at basically all prizes, all international science prizes in chemistry, biology, and medicine, and physics. Uh, and when we looked at, at, at all of those prizes and everybody who got those prizes and, and the papers that they got the prizes for, or if it was just to them, the distribution of likely prizes, likely papers that would have been the basis for the prize. Um, what we find, this is like, it's, it's more detailed than perhaps you wanted as an answer, but um, when we looked at basically the novelty with which contents had been combined in prior papers, right? So this is like literally keywords, like, you know, and then separately the novelty with which contents had been combined, which is, you know, like, oh, the, this journal, you know, this conference, you know, if we just take basically the venues, right? Um, that uh, that novel content um, is associated with uh, the prediction of awards and lightly with the prediction of citations or, or hit citations, especially. Um, and that context citations are strongly associated with scientific impact, like very strongly and predictably associated with impact, um, but are in some cases negatively associated with awards, especially the Nobel Prizes, but also Many of the other prizes. And the reason is because prizes are given by contexts. They're given by fields. They're given by, you know, a committee for physics. Like they systematically undervalue things that violate the boundaries of their context. Uh, and so, um, so that is a strong, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I even call it a bias. I mean, that's just what awards are, you know, like that is constitutionally you know, who gets assembled to produce an award. But if you were to imagine that awards are for good science, right, uh, you know, which, which I don't, but if you were to imagine that that's what awards are for, then uh, they would be biasing with respect to that whatever platonically good science. Uh, it doesn't have to be platonic. I mean, I could, you know, give state values, but, um, but they basically are, are the papers that combine unusual things which are familiar to a community. That's that's what get, gets awarded in general, and especially that's what gets awarded for the Nobel Prize. So things that basically have people have tried to combine for a long time, and they get combined, that gets an award.
so it's now nearing uh, one o'clock. So let's do two more questions. Start with you. Yes. I'll try and make it quick. It's a very compelling presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, on the question of actually how do we build this ensemble <laughs> of diverse intelligences, it reminded me of uh, mm. the work of ba Bas Hoktra and colleagues on the diversity innovation paradox, where you know diverse teams and they operationalize diversity as race and gender are better for innovation, but actually devalued in science and in scholarship. So in the spirit of science being reflexive and really thinking about who dominates science and you know what implications it has for team composition, I'd be very curious to hear what your thoughts are on, I guess, who counts as diverse teams, where diversity means everything and nothing, and also considering the sort of power imbalances in knowledge production around the world. Yeah, no, I think we're, we're definitely screwed, uh, <laughs> and, uh, to your point, uh, just as a, I mean, it's an objective, <laughs> you know, unvalued statement. I, I love that paper. Um, I also love uh, another finding that, that came out uh, from Rembrandt Koenig, uh, and, uh, and colleagues in science last fall, which showed that there are consequences to this besides just not only in science. So for example, he showed that, um, that women are less likely to be and to be able to become inventors, but when they are able to become inventors, then it's much more likely that the inventions that they make will be relevant to women. So it's much more likely that biomedical innovations that come out of their work will be relevant to women's health, uh, disproportionately in terms of disability adjusted life years or just in terms of the classification. So I think there, there are at least two uh, and probably more reasons why we should consider identity-based uh, diversities as well as kind of cognitive diversities, um, partly because they're correlated uh, and we can show that. I mean, because at the very least there's a a different male female distribution across uh, the, the range of sciences, but also just because of the ways in which lived experience might end up shaping this McFarland et al. result, which is basically that diverse identities are associated with more surprising papers uh, for which uh, the, the producers get less credit. And um, so I think, I think the bottom line is if we keep giving them less credit, um, or if we preclude or reduce the likelihood that they can participate in those teams, that you know we basically kill the source of potential activated novelty for the purpose of science and the likelihood of broader relevance for the consumption of scientific goods. So yes, yeah, so I think this is in some sense part of I would call it increasingly a normative project. Uh, you know, uh, of mine, I didn't think of it, I didn't begin with this as a normative project, but it has become a normative project, is to try to think about how to value those different kinds of diversity to effectively uh, pre preserve a pool, I'll call it like a reservoir of diverse scientific resources from which an abductive surprise can be resolved, right, in ways that become relevant to society. So yeah, super important, relevant point. And it reveals what I'm truly about. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the talk. It's given me a lot to think about. Um, and it's also sort of challenging some of my instincts about how to address the replication crisis. Um, so I thought that was really valuable. Um, so the question, you start talking about small teams versus large teams, and then we move into a discussion of team flatness and leadership ratios. Different papers. Um, and I'm wondering, um, is this really about team size or is it really about team structure and are large flat teams good too? Does size really matter if we control for structure? Um, what's the important thing here? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so you know, the structure at the top was a historical structure. You know, the first paper was a team size paper because team size is easier to measure. And the second paper was a structure paper because it was harder to measure and uh, and uh, but I think we measured it you know I mean I, I'm not how well did we measure it I mean it certainly corresponds with anything that anybody else has said about the structure of these teams that I, it, it doesn't deviate from expectations um, it turns out that flatness matters more but size matters you know and size correlates with flatness so you know, but yeah, they, but they both independently exert what appears to be an influence across the distribution of scientists and also within any one scientist. 
right? So a fixed author effect and a fixed field effect. So, so basically they all matter, but what matters the most is flatness. And I think the reason it matters, I think relates to the last question, is that when more people are engaged in leading activity, it activates the diversity of intelligences. They're resolving surprises in the scientific process. Uh, and, um, and, you know, ironically, you know, the bigger the team that you have, it doesn't decrease the cognitive breadth of the team uh, necessarily because of uh, these kind of organizational pressures. Uh, and so that's how they confound. But, sure, really uh, thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, perhaps we can have one last question before going to lunch, and then I think we come back to those questions. Uh, I was wondering if there's some reflection on what to explain, like the growing conservatism or lack of novelty when scientists age. Is it like an institutional thing, a practical thing, or a cognitive thing, like neural pathways slowing down or something? And yeah, I yeah. I mean, I would just be talking out of my ass here because uh, I don't know. You know, I looked at like, you know, hundreds of millions of scientists, you know, from papers. Uh, but uh, I think um, that uh, I think this clearly an institutional effect. Um, do I think it accounts for everything? Probably not. Right. So I think that, um, you know, and that institutional effect kind of comes in multiple forms. So one aspect of the institutional effect is the fact that once you produce a paper and an explanation, that other people cite that explanation, they invite you to conferences like this one because they expect you to talk about the thing that you wrote before and not the thing you're about to write. Um, so I think these institutional pressures are certainly, that's one. A second level of institutional pressure is just the fact that biographically the fact that uh, it's very unlikely uh, that people switch uh, the nature or the direction of their claim. And we've looked at this at very precise level of times. It's very unlikely. So for example, there's this beautiful paper in uh, BMI, uh, British Medical uh, Journal, BMJ, I'm sorry, British Medical Journal um, in 2010, which basically shows that, um, that researchers who identified this association or claimed this association between uh, beta amyloid and neural plaques, which were predictive of Alzheimer's onset, um, that you know there were some uncertain papers and some certain papers. There were a cluster of about seven of those papers that all came out about the same time. And then uh, later people only cited the certain and not the uncertain papers, including the authors of both the certain and the uncertain papers. Like they became more certain just as a function of being exposed to their own prior histories, which were disproportionately uh, accentuated by the fact that everyone else was citing them, right? So they basically became more certain over time as a function of the, their, their own prior successful self. So I think that, um, that those are definitely forces at work. I would, I, I would be blown away if, if an experiment wouldn't demonstrate the existence of both of those causal forces. Do I think there's also some genetic institution, right? Or there's like some neural pathway plasticity that reduces? I totally, I think that's very likely, you know? I think that's, I think that I wouldn't be blown away. I'm not suggesting that these are an exclusion to that. I just, I would strongly believe that these are forces that are likely correlated with that. Yeah. So. Thank you very much. And so let's conclude here. Thank you again.